Hey there, it's been a while. So hopefully by now, you've seen my short showcase of this device. Those of you who did really seem to enjoy it. And I want to thank the r slash Spider-Man community for being so supportive as well. I posted a short clip from that video and it became the top post on that subreddit with 3.1 thousand upvotes. So thank you, Reddit. When this video comes out, it will have been a little over a year since I first made my announcement for Dragline Dynamics. That's my dream laboratory where I and others will be able to work on web shooters, web fluid, and a whole host of technologies that are set to change the world for the better. And we'll be able to work these technologies to perfection. I wanna thank you guys for sticking with me over the past year. It's been rocky at times and there are a lot of things I, I wish I could have done that I didn't get the chance to do, but what I did do, I'm extremely proud of. And that's in no small part thanks to my patrons. Now, the people who are committed to helping me to this day are USS Nate, VC, Kenneth Anderson, Nick, Colby C, Spider Device, D1, Max, Ronald Paskiang, Cam Myers, Rakshan, Rosnian, Spider 610, Jeff Zachary Woodhurst, Nicholas Sykes, and Caleb Choice. Now thanks to you guys, Dragline Dynamics now has about $100 a month of funding, give or take. And that's insane. That is amazing. And I'm cherishing every last one of those dollars. But we're going to need all the help we can get to get this dream up and running. And that is why today I'm announcing a raffle, a pledge back to one lucky patron. This fantastic web shooter could be yours. Better yet, a substantially upgraded version of this fantastic web shooter could be yours. This device is just a prototype, but you could own version two, which will be sleeker, prettier, and perform even better. I'm gonna make it silver. All you have to do is have a lifetime pledge of $50 or more donated to my Patreon by December 1st. That's right, for just $50, you could own a high-tech web shooter. I'll provide you with some web fluid as well to get you started. Don't worry about how it integrates with my super suit or anything like that. I will make sure you have everything you need to have it work the way it's supposed to. And believe me, this device is worth a lot more than $50. So pledge now to get it out of the way. If by December 1st, you have donated a total of $50 to my Patreon, you could be the lucky winner of the most advanced web shooter in existence. And I'll make sure you have it by Christmas. For the winner, I'll do my best to fulfill any requests you have for the design before I ship it to you. Now, there will only be one winner, but remember that all of this money isn't going to me. It's going toward the funding of the Dragline Dynamics Laboratory, and that can only mean one thing. You contribute to the future of scientific research on WebShooter, and that's always a good thing. Oh, and current patrons, all you people I mentioned earlier, regardless of your current lifetime pledge, you guys are automatically entered. No worries. Thank you guys for your continued support, really, from the bottom of my heart. So with all that said, let's get into the technical breakdown of this device. I'm sure you're all dying to know what kind of engineering went into this bad boy. It's kind of a lot. Let's check it out. I started designing this device in January, and I knew a few things going in. I knew it would use the existing hardware for my concealable web shooter, which was already very high performing, but needed help with a few things. I knew it would need electronic activation of the webbing. That means it needs an actuator to convert electricity into movement. I knew it had to regulate the web fluid temperature. That means it needs a heat source. Both of these things will require drivers and a controller of some kind. And I knew it had to integrate with my trigger glove that I had already built, which you can learn about in this video. Most importantly, it wouldn't have a battery. It would be powered by my already developed SuperSuit power pack, which you can learn more about in this video. Just click the card to be sent there. I elected to break up the web shooter into distinct modules that serve different purposes. There would be the main unit, which houses the aluminum body of the concealable web shooter, as well as its other features, including the valve and the filling port. This unit would also have the heater and temperature sensor, which would regulate the temperature of the aluminum and the fluid within. It would contain the mechanism which opens the valve, but not necessarily the actuator itself. That duty would go to the motor unit, which would house the actuator, likely an electric motor, and any transmission required to amplify the output force. Then the interface unit, where the user can view the current temperature on a display and change the set point temperature, as well as turn the heat on and off. There could be some useful indicator LEDs as well. Then you'd have the controller unit, which would interpret signals from the trigger, from the interface unit, from the temperature sensor, and convert them into signals sent to the driver unit, which takes the signals from the controller and converts them into the power that is sent to the heater and the actuator, which in turn act on the aluminum web shooter 
in the main unit. From these descriptions, we can construct what is called a mechatronic block diagram, which is very helpful for showing all the different ways mechanical and electrical power are transmitted in this mechatronic system, which basically means any system that has movement, powered by electricity, and some form of control or computation behind it. In this case, we also have thermal processes, which is why I constructed the word thermomechatronic to describe this web shooter. Designing all of these independent units was extremely difficult. Not only did they have to function, they also had to remain relatively small and sleek. Looking back, I'm confident I could do even better for the next version. Now, the main unit, despite its importance, is still relatively simple, except for a few things I'll discuss later on. My first version of this contained a piston that can be pulled to actuate the valve, which the pre-built concealable web shooter could simply slip into from above. I also added an external extension of the button that is used to release the empty cartridges from the filling port. The heater was, at least initially, the most technically complex part of the main unit. But first, why have this feature at all? Temperature is a funny thing. It can vastly change the way our devices work. Ever have your phone die at 50% battery in the cold? Or have your 3D print warp off the bed because of a draft? Heat is a property of matter that manifests in the kinetic energy of individual molecules. The slower the molecules move, the colder the matter is. In gases, this results in a decrease in pressure. In liquids, this results in an increase in viscosity or thickness. If you've been watching my videos for the past year, you'll know where I'm going with this. The hagen poiseuille equation models steady viscous fluid flow through a circular pipe, like the nozzle of our web shooter. It uses length, diameter, viscosity, and pressure to model the speed of the fluid, as the pressure balances the viscous force in an equilibrium. Keeping the geometry of the nozzle the same, we can see that decreasing the pressure will reduce the speed of the fluid, and increasing the viscosity will do the same. Both of these things happen when the fluid gets colder. So that's why we see things like this when I'm operating in 28 degrees Fahrenheit, or minus 2 Celsius. In that temperature, the vapor pressure of my propellant drops to 39 psi, which means the pressure difference, the actual driving force of propulsion, is only about 24 psi. That's lower than car tire pressure, and it definitely helps to explain what happened here. And this isn't even taken into account the viscosity increase. If you want to know more about how this works, I definitely recommend my series on web shooter science, where I talk about these concepts in depth. So I'm sure you can see why I considered the heater a necessity for this project. And rather than resistance heating, where the electric power loss in the heating element gets converted to heat directly, I elected to use a Peltier module, which in theory is more efficient because it moves thermal energy from one side to the other, instead of converting from electrical energy. It's like a small heat pump in this way, and why these devices can be used for both heating and cooling. Theoretically, I could intentionally make the web fluid colder to have a slower exit velocity, but I would have to add a capability for reversing the polarity on this Peltier module, which would require some additional hardware, as I'll discuss when talking about the driver unit. For now, I'm only using single polarity control, meaning I can only heat the web fluid, not cool it. And heating is the main purpose of this feature anyway. I also use the thermistor to measure the temperature, which will be used for control. A thermistor is basically just a resistor that changes resistance based on its temperature. You can construct a voltage divider with a thermistor and a constant resistor, and the voltage in the middle will change as the thermistor's resistance changes due to temperature. This analog signal can be interpreted by the controller. The thermistor should be placed between the heater and the aluminum web shooter body while maintaining good thermal conduction between all of these. So I used this ICE-9 Flex Thermally Conductive 3D Printing Filament from TC Poly. I made a small fixture to hold the thermistor in place that should also in theory conduct heat between the Peltier module and the aluminum body. After all that, I made a cover that can hold the concealable web shooter in place. It's attached with screws, but I definitely plan to have something more accessible in the future. In the unlikely event that something goes wrong, it'd be nice to be able to fix the problem on the fly. The motor unit was tricky to get right. I'm ashamed to say it, but I didn't model the necessary force for the valve to open and sort of made a shot in the dark with my initial motor unit design. Part of the reason for this is I didn't have any specifications for the motor I used, so I wouldn't know what to do with this model anyway. I was dead set on using this small motor, even though it likely would not be able to activate the valve as fast. I used a bevel gear transmission to save space, and this proved to be the right way to do it, but there were a few other things I got wrong at first. 
Initially, I had a design that had two cables be simultaneously pulled by the pulley attached to the output bevel gear. These two cables would wrap around the wrist in opposite directions, and both would simultaneously pull the valve open. Now, I think the reason why I did that was because I thought the motor unit would be one of the biggest units, and thus need to be placed on the other side of the wrist, so the cables would have to run through all other units and the buckle. I had built this elaborate buckle with pulleys inside so that the cable would be tighter when it's fastened than when it's unfastened, so that you can still put it on. As you can imagine, friction ended up playing a pretty big role here. I initially had a 3 to 1 bevel gear transmission in this unit, and then I had to up it to 5 to 1 when that didn't open the valve. Then when the 5 to 1 transmission didn't open the valve either, I had to do a really sneaky fix to get some extra leverage. That's what you see in this video. Now keep in mind, with a 5 to 1 gear transmission and this lever providing an extra mechanical advantage of about 2, we effectively have a 10 to 1 transmission between the motor and the valve. And while this worked great in this video, which I proudly posted on Instagram, it was not reliable at all, and it was quite slow due to the large transmission. This was unacceptable, so I went back to the drawing board. I did some experiments to test different transmissions, keeping the lever idea in mind. I found that the motor on its own, in the absence of friction, was capable of opening the valve, with two simple transmission steps. Step one, a pulley system with a mechanical advantage of two, and step two, a lever with a mechanical advantage of two. When adopting this into the web shooter, I added a bevel gear system once again, this time with a 2 to 1 ratio, just to add an additional safety factor, and to slightly change the direction in which the cable was pulled. The motor unit is now much smaller, and I can place it right next to the main unit. I learned so much while designing this. For instance, there are so many ways to design something, but the best ways may not be obvious. You've got to dig deep for them. Next, let's go over the interface unit. Here, I decided to use three buttons. That's even before I knew what the interface would be. I figured any basic menu GUI needed three buttons minimum to function, as up, down, and enter. I added the smallest display screen I could find. I wish the screen could do color, and I kind of wish it was a touch screen, but it does everything I need it to do. Just show the current temperature and the set point temperature. I also included an indication of calculated theoretical pressure. So out here it's about 60 degrees, and even then, the vapor pressure of the propellant of the web fluid, R134A tetrafluoro, I think, the vapor pressure drops to about 80 PSI. What I've included in this web shooter is a heating unit, and essentially what that does is it heats the main web shooter chamber uh, and increases the vapor pressure. So for instance, I've got the temperature set to 80 degrees Fahrenheit, and uh, that means that the pressure will be set to about 100 PSI. So you can increase the pressure by 20 PSI just by heating, I guess about 20 degrees. The device calculates the pressure for you so you don't need to know what pressure uh, comes with what temperature. Um, it does all that. So the user can see the effect that really matters. This is a form of feed forward control, meaning that while we don't measure the pressure directly, we can still approximately control it using a reasonable assumption of physical laws. In this case, the vapor pressure of the saturated propellant should have a known value at a certain temperature, and I exploit that here. I added two LEDs of my signature colors blue and orange, and I ended up using the orange to indicate when the heat is on, and the blue to indicate when the web shooter receives a high value from the trigger. Both of these lights provided valuable when troubleshooting the functions of the device. The controller unit is quite simple. It really only has one component, an Arduino Nano. This is a small reprogrammable microcontroller, which I've programmed to use information from the three buttons on the interface unit, the temperature sensor in the main unit, and the trigger output, and decide what the motor and the Peltier module should do, as well as manage the LEDs and the display. In the future, this unit could be much smaller, as Dragline Dynamics will have the capability for custom-made PCBs soon, so an entire Arduino board won't be necessary. Now, you're probably asking, how do you get the Arduino to control the Peltier module and the motor? Well, that's where the driver module comes in. Drivers are integral parts to any mechatronic system, but are sometimes forgotten in design. This is critical because they can take up a lot of space, so you'd better be sure you account for it. When you're using low power electronic devices like LEDs, you can just have them powered by a digital output pin, like those on the Arduino in my case. 
These typically are set at providing 5 volts to a device and can't supply much current, which is fine for an LED. However, a higher output device, like a motor or a Peltier module, will require current that the Arduino cannot supply and may also require a higher voltage. Then, a driver is required to take the low power signals output by the Arduino and amplify them, drawing power selectively from the power supply. A motor driver will almost always consist of an H-bridge, and my web shooter is no different. An H-bridge is a clever bit of circuitry that allows control over the polarity of the output, which is, in this case, the motor. This means we can control the direction of rotation. It's important because we will need to open the valve and allow it to close as the transmission we've created is not easily back-drivable. I constructed my H-bridge to draw from a 12-volt source, using four field-effect transistors as shown here. When these two transistors are provided with a high value at the gate, and the other two are provided with a low value at the gate, then the motor spins clockwise. When the gate voltages are reversed, the motor spins counterclockwise. I had to play around with this a bit, and I had to add two smaller bipolar junction transistors to amplify the input signals from 5 volts to 12 volts, to ensure that the H-bridge is comparing the gate voltage with the motor supply voltage successfully. My power pack has a standard regulated 5 volt output, so I needed a converter inside the web shooter to supply the motor's power. Which is why I developed this inhibitor chip to protect my higher brain function. That's why the driver unit also includes this boost converter, which I have set to output 12 volts given a 5 volt input. If you've never encountered these converters before, this may seem like magic, but these guys follow the law of conservation of energy. If my motor draws one amp of current at 12 volts, then it's consuming 12 watts of power, or 12 joules per second. And this output energy cannot be more than the input energy, meaning the input energy has to be at least 12 joules per second. With 5 volts at the input, that means the converter is drawing 2.4 amps of current, and it's probably higher than that due to inefficiency in the circuit. That is to say, some energy is lost as heat. So there's a little engineering lesson for you. When you amplify output voltage, you're also amplifying input current. If I wanted to have my Peltier module both heat up and cool down the fluid, as mentioned earlier, I would need a second H-bridge for a total of eight MOSFETs. That would take up a lot of space in the web shooter. Luckily, since I'm only heating up the web fluid, I only need one transistor as a driver. I found that the Peltier module still builds up quite the temperature difference when only provided with five volts, so I elected to get its power directly from the power pack to lower the current that's flowing through the boost converter, as I'm using one of the smallest boost converters there are. That means our driver module consists of five field effect transistors, two bipolar junction transistors, and one boost converter, as well as a handful of resistors. I used the Ice 9 Flex filament again to make a heat sink for the transistors, even though MOSFETs do not get super hot in this situation. That also makes them good for drivers, because there's less power loss from resistance. All of this results in the driver unit being the bulkiest unit on the device, except for maybe the main unit. But I'm confident that with a redesign and the inclusion of custom PCBs, its footprint can be reduced a considerable amount. To tie it all together, I added this 3D printed buckle, which can certainly be improved as well. I used some silk orange PLA filament to give all the unit covers a nice sleek look. Though since not everyone is as keen on these colors as I am, I'll be giving the raffle winner an upgraded sleek silver model. So what's next? Well, it's been a stacked year. I made plans and I carried them out. I made a non-planar 3D printer specifically for Spider-Man lenses. I made a couple of different Doc Ock tentacles. I made a concealable web shooter. I made a smart triggering glove. And I made the most advanced web shooter to ever grace the earth. Most importantly, I taught you guys about web shooters and robotics, physics, chemistry, geometry, and electronics. I did experiments, and I did simulations. Hopefully by now, you can trust that given the resources, I can tackle any engineering problem headed my way. So it's time for me to get ready for Dragline Dynamics. For the summer, you'll see me post a lot, and there will be new content, I promise. I'm also going to do some shorter segments of clips I'm proud of from this year, and some recuts of older videos. I think you guys will enjoy these, so stay tuned. As for new content, I'm shifting gears to focus on my next big project, a web shooter that's meant for swinging. And yes, Dragline Dynamics is coming, so enter the raffle for a chance to win this web shooter, or simply chip in any amount on my Patreon at patreon.com slash theamazing. It's all for the greater good, so help us out. Oh, and follow me on Instagram at the.amazing.labs for more frequent updates. 
The links to all of these, as well as my Discord server, are in the description below. And now, to close us out, here's a few web stunts for you to enjoy. Only made possible by this fantastic invention. And don't forget, with your support, we'll be swinging soon. Stay safe, stay amazing, and I'll see you guys in the next one.